Wonderful. So I believe we are live, and um, I know that we've got a number of people who weren't able to make it tonight who are probably tuning in, and so we will uh, just bring up the feed for them so that we can see that they're here and help them feel welcome as well. Uh, and we want to wish our kehila in Long Island, uh, in New York, a chag sameach, chag Hanukkah sameach, Shabbat Shalom Lechem uh, to all of you and those who are watching from Germany and other parts of the world from North Carolina. We want to welcome all of you to our meeting. We're um, fortunate to be meeting together on site tonight and that's a blessing for us and we want to share that with you. Um, and if we can and we see you on the feed, we'll say hi to you. Uh, in fact, do you guys all want to wish a Hanukkah Sameach to everybody? If I give you a countdown... We'll do a Chag Hanukkah Sameach, okay? Three, two, one. Chag Hanukkah Sameach. The sad is, not bad. Chag Hanukkah Sameach to everyone watching us online, and I'm afraid that I may not be paying much attention you, to you from here on forward because uh, I've got faces in front of me that I want to look at. Um, so tonight we are... We are um, celebrating the sixth night of Hanukkah, uh, the Jewish days beginning in the evening. And so today is day five and it's finishing as the sun goes down, the sixth night of Hanukkah. And a lot of people aren't aware that actually Hanukkah is a redo of Sukkot. You see, because when we were under the tyranny of Antiochus Epiphanes, we were unable to celebrate the festivals. Why? Because he had desecrated the temple. He had defiled it. His armed forces were there guarding it. None of us could make Aliyah. None of us could go up for the festivals. So we had gone devoid of the festivals that we knew we had to be in Jerusalem for each year for several years. And so when we finally redeemed the time and took back the temple and cleansed it, we were a bit late for Sukkot. Sukkot had already been and gone. And so we redid Sukkot. And that's why Hanukkah is done. So it's almost like a redo of Sukkot. And part of that is the connection to the dedication of the temple, which is how it, how it got its name. So essentially, Hanukkah is the Hebrew word meaning dedication. So it also reminded us as a people of when Solomon, Melech Shlomo, first dedicated the temple of God in Jerusalem. It's incredible how it all weaves together and all of that feeds into Yeshua's participation in this festival. Okay, and it'll be exciting to learn um, about that tonight, but we're going to begin, as is our custom, with um, some worship songs together and... We're going to spend a little bit longer playing music tonight because, believe it or not, Yaakov's message is quite short tonight. And I see people rejoicing even more, the delight on their faces. Wow. So we're going to enjoy worshipping the Lord together with music. First of all, we're going to do an a cappella rendition of a very famous Hanukkah hymn. Okay, and this is how it reads in English. What a mighty rock stronghold of my salvation to praise you is a delight restore my house of prayer that's a name for the temple restore my house of prayer and there we will bring a rededication offering wow what beautiful words so now i'm going to sing it through once to you those of you who know it can join me. Those of you who don't can join the second time through. And those of you online who are in the same position, listen to it the first time through, join in with us the second time through. Maoz Sur. Maoz Yeshuati Lechanae Lechabeach Tikun Beit Tefilati Vesham Toda Nizabea Lietachin Matbeach Mi 
pretty good for people who don't know it. Wow. So now let's do it again as people who do know it. Ma'otzo Yeshuati Lechanae Leshabea Tikon Bek Tefilati Vesham Toda Nezabea Letachin Matbea Mitzar Hamina Bea Azigmo Bishir Mizmor Chanukat Hamizbea Azigmo Bishir Mizmor Chanukat Hamizbea Tov me'od me'od Metsuyan, yofi Good job, good job Really good, excellent I'm just translating what I said um, And we're going to begin with the central prayer of our faith uh, unless, unless God is one, there is nothing. So, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad.
Okay, why no any noise those noises I was making the um, the charismatics and Pentecostals uh, among us uh, would probably call that speaking in tongues. Uh, we Jews call it negun, negun. Okay, um, worshiping without words, but God knows my heart. The Wahakodesh. We want to say Shabbat Shalom to Paul and your wife in Germany. I see that you've logged in. We're all wishing you Shabbat Shalom. Vechak Sameach, Vechak Sameach. And also to Johnny and Charlie and your precious baby. Yalla. Okay. Everybody loves you here. I don't know what. Okay. <laughs> I just. I just haven't had a real good feed here on my, my internet, so I didn't see you till now. But I just wanted to let you know we see you. And also, Pierre, we see you, and Karen's here, so she's already on deck here, but we love you too. Pierre, Shabbat Shalom. Isabel, we see you. Shabbat Shalom. Patricia, story. Come on, Yalla. Chag Sameach. Shabbat Shalom. So we see all of you, and we welcome you. Uh, into community with us from a distance. Baruch Hashem, what a wonderful blessing to be able to be community of faith this way. Okay, a song for me that's come out of this present darkness. We're gonna see. We're gonna sing I like David did, and then at the end we're gonna sing we together. Be a fool 
Shabbat Shalom to Charles. I see you there, brother. Charles Grady and, and your wonderful wife. I want to say Shabbat Shalom to Ahuva and the Mishpacha Nesu and uh, all the Mishpacha down there in Rotorua. So uh, give them all a big Shabbat Shalom. Uh, Lucina Edwards and who else? Okay. Henera. Una, we say Shabbat Shalom to you. Anachnu ochevim otcha. We all love you. And uh, we also say Shabbat Shalom to someone named Junior Turua. Shabbat Shalom, Junior. Nice to have you with us for the first time, I think. Okay. And there might be more of you too. And Ryan, Ryan Fred. Achshale, Yudi brother. Manani ma bibi. Okay, so I think we've covered everybody. If we missed you, we love you just the same, uh, vaccinated or not. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that out loud, but I did. Um, and just because... <clears throat> I think the Lord's got a bit of a sense of humour, but... Um, well, the, but that's been my experience. Do you think that the Lord's got a sense of humor? <laughs> wow, well said, Rabbi. Kol akavod. Um, o come, Emmanuel. You know, you, you maybe you wouldn't expect this song at a synagogue, but who knew? And when you read the words, then you take a second guess and wonder why you wouldn't expect this song at a synagogue, given that our Yom Kippur prayers are very Messiah-centric. We, we desperately cry for him. So actually, I think this is a really good synagogue song, O Come, Emmanuel. Now, I may have adapted the words slightly, um, because that's the kind of guy I am. I thought it needed to sound just a little bit more Jewy. And so, and so now it does, but we're going to play it together um, because coming up real soon, our family, who celebrates Hanukkah, also celebrates Christmas. And so we're going to sing this song to remind all those Messianic Christmas haters out there that we are a free people, that we are no longer in bondage but we have been set free for freedom. Probably another thing I shouldn't have said. <laughs>
Yaakov couldn't remember the words he changed. Hmm. We're going to do one more song which um, I'm very fond of because my daughter sings a verse in it. Hey. It's not as many words he has to remember. Oh, yeah. well played. <laughs> it's just as well this isn't a professional organisation. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, well, um, it's wonderful to be able to worship God together in person, isn't it? Um, and it's my, it's my um, deep felt hope. <clears throat> It's my deep, deep felt hope that um, we, will, we will, as a body of believers, and I don't just mean locally, I mean as a body of believers worldwide, it's my deep felt hope and prayer that we will understand, and this will only be by divine intervention, that we will understand what unity means. Not what agreeing on everything means. What agreeing on sound core doctrine and unity means. And it's my prayer that those who have been deceived by a spirit of division will have the blinders pulled away from their eyes. Amen. And that, that we as, as a body will learn to love each other well. That we will, that we will learn to discriminate only on the basis of those things which the word of God would have us discriminate against. Um, and thank you, a room full of people who agree with that prayer. Isn't that wonderful? And you're not the only ones. That It saddens me that, so, that I've had negative feedback from people this week for suggesting that we need to be one. For, for suggesting that this whole chaos of COVID-19 and vaccinations shouldn't divide us. And it saddens me that that kind of position would garner hate in, from other believers. It does, it saddens me. So it really warms my heart that you agree <laughs> with that prayer. And um, I'm also encouraged because <clears throat> I was asked to give my opinion on the current climate. And so I wrote an article giving a biblical perspective. And I was really encouraged to receive emails from people I don't know who were just thankful that someone brought up scripture as an issue. Because like myself, and I don't know about you guys, but I've read a lot of articles 
regarding the current divisiveness. And the only scripture that was tacitly mentioned in any of them was love your neighbor as yourself. So I was really encouraged that there are believers who still think that the word of God is the measure for our moral decisions. That encourages me. And so I had a lovely letter from the UK. But what saddens me is the number of people who contact me and say, but le Christian leaders aren't saying these things. That's what saddens me. Um, well, there's, there's lots, of different, lots of different things are being said, but the focus is not on the word of God or on the person of Yeshua. Um, and look, these are grave days we're in, and what a wonderful time to celebrate Hanukkah. Yeah, yeah for a number of reasons. Thanks for the clap, Karen. Karen is awesome on Twitter, by the way. I, I know I don't look like a guy who would use Twitter, but um, Karen's awesome on Twitter. Um, Hanukkah, which it means dedication, but really when you think about the events of the story of Hanukkah, it's a re-dedication, isn't it? <laughs> it had been done before and it needed to happen again. And let's face it, we had these tyrannical enemies, but also as a people we were sinning. So we went through this time of torment, and it was terrible. But it was also a time for us to reassess what it really meant to be worshippers of Hashem. This, this tyrannical ruler was saying, remove the name of Hashem everywhere. Put the names of my gods in. And I mean his name, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, the image of the visible God is what his name meant. He was an antichrist before Mashiach was born. And here we came, we retook the temple, but we also understood that we needed to allow God to retake our hearts. And so, rededication. And we chose to celebrate it with light. So in the midst of the turmoil, the present turmoil, and it's not just in Aotearoa, New Zealand, it's throughout the Western world and throughout the world as a whole, in the midst of this turmoil, we come to this season and we're offered by God an opportunity to rededicate our lives. That's not to say that at some point in the last two years when COVID hit, you lost your salvation. What it is to say is we are being sanctified and have we come to a place now where we need to repent and to allow the dark corners of our being to be flooded with the light of the King Messiah, Yeshua? And so I think it's neat how God has these really timely festivals that come along. And because the, those watching online didn't hear it earlier, I'm going to make my joke again because it's the only one I've got. So Hanukkah is like a lot of other Jewish festivals, okay? The bad guys tried to kill us, God saved us, we celebrated by eating food. <laughs> and that's Passover, Purim, and Hanukkah, and you all politely laughed again, and you guys online better be laughing. Okay. <laughs> that's it. That's all the jokes I've got for tonight. I wanted to just give you the basics on, on Hanukkah, and some of you will say, I hear the basics every year. I'll know not again. Well, maybe you'll hear something new this year, so bear with me. So Hanukkah commemorates this historical event that took place in Jerusalem in the 2nd century BCE. And it was when the Seleucid Greek Empire was the ruling power. So it took place in 168 BCE. And I've mentioned this king or this ruler, Antiochus IV Epiphanes, whose name means manifest image of the invisible God. He outlawed Jewish practice and defiled the Jewish temple in the city of Jerusalem by installing an altar to the false deity Zeus. Let this sink in. The Jerusalem of the holy God, the one true God, 
the temple of the one true God. He defiled it with the false deity Zeus Olympius, the chief deity of the Greek pantheon. So Zeus is the chief deity of the Greek pantheon, just as Allah is the chief deity of the ancient Arabic pantheon. So he brought this false god into the holy temple of Hashem, Yotevafe, of God. He also sacrificed pigs there. Now, as a Jew, I mean, I throw up a little in my mouth when I hear that. I'm not telling you not to eat pork, but guys, don't be bringing pork into the holy temple of God. I mean, not unless you want a lightning bolt to hit you. Well, actually, God used Maccabees. Lightning bolts didn't hit them, but I think a few swords and spears did. Okay, that is not a call for holy war, by the way. Okay, just to be clear. So a small army of Jews, known as the Maccabees, and they, they were sort of led by their father initially, and uh, quite a radical guy. One of Antiochus's representatives went to this small village, Modin, and he said, look, you guys need to sacrifice to our false gods. The, main, the father, the Maccabee, says to him, we won't do that. He says, look, just come and pretend to do it because you're a leader of this village and if they see you pretending to do it, they'll be on board. Well, he also refused to pretend to do it. And if you know your scripture, that's godly. We are not even to be seen to be doing what's evil. That's what the scripture teaches. But what he did and said was he took up a sword and he slew that man. And the rebellion began with him and his sons from this small village. And it spread throughout Israel. And slowly, after a number of years, they gained enough momentum to retake Jerusalem and to cleanse the temple and restore the practices of the temple. And, you know, Greeks have heroes. Jews don't really have heroes. Jews have prophets. And so, in, in a sense, the Maccabean warriors were like warrior prophets. And if you think that there's, there's no warrior prophets in the word of God, I give you Shemuel, Samuel. There is such a thing as a warrior prophet. So Samuel slew King Agag because King Saul didn't get the job done. The story of Hanukkah, the popular legend, goes like this, that when they came into the temple, most of the holy oil for lighting the temple menorah, that's the candle, multi-branch candle stand, had been defiled and was unusable. Now, of course, the menorah, the sacred candle stand, is the light, the main light for the temple. And the temple is windowless. Not a lot of people think about this. It also had a roof. Okay, so it has one entrance way where light might come in a little bit. But given the size of it, for the most part, the temple is pitch black without the light of the menorah. Now, the story goes that a small vial of consecrated oil had been hidden and was found, and there was enough oil to light the menorah for one day. But instead of it light, being a light for just one day, each day as they returned, the menorah continued to burn. And this went on for eight days, and this is why we have this miracle of the eight days, the eight days of Hanukkah. And all of this comes about in 168 or so BCE, long before the birth of the King Messiah Yeshua, so that this celebration continued to be practiced by Jews for many, many years, year after year, so that when Yeshua came into the world, he too was brought up with this tradition as part of his faith practice and the rites of his faith. That's how the story goes. 
I've got another slide here for you with some of the key symbols of Hanukkah, and I think it's worth taking a look at them again. You'll see that there's some great looking food there, and we've already eaten latkes and um, sufganiyot tonight. So that's the donuts and the fried potato uh, morsels there with sour cream and oh, mm. <clears throat> and uh, apple on there. Unfortunately, I can't eat those off the screen. And then you'll see some really strange looking spinning tops there. Those are ancient dreidels, or rather they're replicas of ancient dreidels, which Julia and I um, were blessed to be able to purchase at uh, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem the last time we were in Iswai. Uh, and then down in the bottom corner you see the Hanuki Yah, and that's the special type of candelabra that we use for Hanukkah, and technically it's wrong to call it a menorah, uh, and so let's talk a little bit about that. So here we have the Hanukkiah, and most people I speak to are very confused about the fact that it's got, well, they say it's got nine candles, and they're not wrong. But the reason they bring that up is because they say, I've read the Bible and I'm pretty sure that that one's supposed to only have seven. Did you Jews get mixed up when you were, I don't, what does the Hebrew say? Does it say nine? We didn't get mixed up. It's not a poor translation to say seven. It's not the menorah. And let me explain why we came to the use of the nine-branched Hanukkiah. The menorah, the seven-branch candelabra of the temple, is a sacred item. It was only to be used to light the temple. So, when this miracle first happened, the priests and probably some of the Abonim of the time were saying, look, we want to commemorate this miracle that's associated with the menorah, but we don't want to desecrate the symbol of the menorah. How are we going to commemorate it? And the priests of antiquity, actually, it's thought that they set up like a long platformed board with notches in it, and then they stuck long stakes into the board one day at a time for the days of Hanukkah with an oil lamp on top of them counting the days of Hanukkah so that even their Hanukkiah didn't even remotely resemble the menorah in order not to desecrate it. Now what a wonderful motive, a great motivation. So that came through into rabbinic Judaism to where we have these, well, their eight-branched menorot with a single shamash in the middle, making up nine. And you'll see in my picture that I've pointed to the middle candle and I've said, this is the shamash. This is what our rabbis have always called it. They perhaps were thinking of the shamash representing a priest who served in the temple. And that's why they came up with this name shamash, which means servant. Now this candle is responsible for lighting each of the other candles, an, an additional candle being lit on each of the days of the miracle of Hanukkah. So that's how we come to this strangely shaped menorah, the Hanukkiah. Then you've got these dreidels, and again, you've heard this story before, but it's an important story, and if you're an indigenous person, who has a language that is in the minority in the world today, you will appreciate this story, that part of Antiochus's reign meant squashing the use of the Hebrew language because we used Hebrew in worship. And if you can squash the use of the language, you can also blot out the name of the God associated to the language. So our people being, well... I've heard it said that sometimes I can be a little stiff-necked. <laughs> I 
we came up with a solution for teaching our children our language, even in, under bondage, even under occupation. I'm going to use that word again. Foreign powers occupied our God-given land. And it is impossible, therefore, for Jews to be occupiers of their ancestral homeland. That's a little political story. <laughs> While these occupiers were in our land and our worship practices were suppressed and our language was being suppressed, we came up with this idea. The soldiers of Antiochus liked to gamble. Here we have a spinning top which we can make a gambling game out of. And on it we're going to put the figures of our Aleph Beit, our alphabet. Now the dreidels we have today are limited to an acronym really that teaches us something about the festival, but the dreidels of that time each had different characters of the Hebrew alphabet on, and we would teach our children from the dreidel the pronunciation of the Aleph Beit, and when the soldiers would come along, we'd ask them to join us and gamble with us. So what a, wonderful, what a wonderful way to keep the language alive. And you might be a Southern Baptist and not like drinking, gambling, or, or any of those things. But, but in this case, in this case we adopted a, a, a Southern Baptist theological term called dispensation. <laughs> okay, that was a theology joke. Never mind. Moving on, moving on. I'm just making them up as I go along. Well, they call that riffing? <laughs> or is that what they called it in the 70s? <laughs> okay, rapping now. So, we have these dreidels today, and when we're in Israel and we look at a dreidel, this is what we see. We see nun, gamel, sorry, gimel, hay, and pay. And we go, eh? That's wrong. It's supposed to be shin at the end. And then the Israelis say to you, no, it's not Shin. Because their dreidel says, Nezgadol Hayapo. A great miracle happened here. Okay? But the next slide is what our dreidels in the diaspora say. Nezgadol Hayasham. A great miracle happened there. You see, they're there and we're here. And so their dreidel says here, and our dreidel says there. Okay, I've talked about the foods, but why do we have these particular foods? Well, you'll notice the common denominator is that they're fried foods. We fry them in oil to remember the miracle of the oil. That's it. If you want to add falafel, you can add falafel. It's fried in oil. If you want to fry your egg in it, fry your egg in it. Anything you do to connect to oil, the miracle of the oil. Now I'd like to read you the portion of Habisoal Piochanan, of the Gospel according to John, where Yeshua, the King Messiah, venerates, is present for the celebration of Hanukkah in Yerushalayim. At that time, the festival of the Hanukkah, so the Greek text says, the dedication. So it actually makes quite a big deal out of it. At that time, the festival of the Hanukkah, that is renewal, dedication, took place in Yerushalayim. It was winter in Yeshua. And Yeshua was walking in the house of the temple in the porch. Of Shlomo, and that's King Solomon. Some of the Jewish religious leaders, Judeans, then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you leave us with our with our breathing heightened? <laughs> okay, I'm literally translating the Greek and Hebrew text here. How long will you leave us with our breathing heightened in suspense? How long will you hold our souls? Tell us 
boldly, plainly, are you the Mashiach? Are you the Messiah? Yeshua answered them, I told you. It reminds me a little bit of, of when my kids were little, you know, and they, they didn't do something straight away. And I, I told you. But there's an incredulity there. There's a principle there. I've told you many times. I've told you and you don't believe. Trust. You're not persuaded. The, the father, sorry, my uh, writing's really small, so I'm just going to go a little closer. You don't believe, you're not persuaded. The toil, occupation, works, deeds that I do in the name of my father, these testify, bear witness of me. But you don't believe, trust, are not persuaded because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear, listen to, receive my voice, sound, and I intimately know them and they follow me. And I give without end to them and they will never be destroyed into the unbroken age. Sorry, and I give life without end to them. And they will never be destroyed, even into the unbroken age. And no one will seize them out of my hand. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to seize them out of the Father's hand. I and my Father, we are one. A complex unity. Some of the Jewish religious leaders, Judeans, picked up stones again to stone him. Yeshua answered them, I showed you many good, perfect, pure works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? Some of the Jewish religious leaders, Judeans, answered him, For a good, perfect, pure work, we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Yeshua answered them, Has it not been written in your Torah? I have said, You are Elohim, judges, rulers, gods. If he called them gods, judges, rulers, to whom the word, essence, substance of the God came, and the word cannot be undone. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and set apart and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am a son of God. If I do not work at the occupation, works of my Father, do not believe, trust, be persuaded in me. But if I do his works, though you do not believe, trust, are not persuaded in me. Believe, trust instead in the works so that you may intimately know and understand, have faith that in me is the Father and in him am I. Therefore they were seeking again to lay hold of him, that's Yeshua, and he eluded their grasp and he went away again beyond the Yarden, the Jordan, to the place where John the Immerser was first performing Tevilah, ritual baptism. And he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while Yohanan, John, performed no mirac miraculous sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And many believed, trusted, put their faith in him in that place. So now that we know the text where Yeshua is in the temple precinct venerating Hanukkah and we understand all that's going on with the celebration of the deliverance of the temple and the rededication of it, we can better understand why Yeshua said the things he said. 
Let's uh, do the story of Hanukkah. I like to do it this way because it's kind of a back then and then in the time of Yeshua way of doing it, so it connects the two stories. So I'll just tell the story for you and just notice the images, that the familiar images are repeated when we come to Yeshua's participation in the festival. The year was 165 BCE. It was a dark time in Israel's history. Israel was being oppressed by an evil world ruler, Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He had banned all practices associated with the worship of the God of Israel. Many Jews had given up their faith in God, and the temple in Jerusalem had been darkened by idolatry. However, a small group of Jews remained faithful to God and refused to bow down to Antiochus and his false gods. It was winter, and a small army of warrior priests led by Judah Maccabee approached the court of Israel, which was inside the temple complex in Jerusalem. As they walked past the altar of sacrifice toward the doorway of the temple, they saw the remnants of burnt pigskin and smelt the foul stench of pig's blood. The temple, devoid of light, and as they entered, the men tripped on debris and slid on pig fat and feces. An idol of the Greek god Zeus stood in the Holy of Holies and the rem remnants of pig parts and fowl littered the floor. What's supposed to be in the Holy Holies? The mercy seat. The seven-branched menorah, the windowless temple's primary source of light, lay toppled on the stone floor. One of the Maccabean warriors called out in the darkness, I've found a vial of undefiled oil. The priestly seal is still on it. I discovered it hidden beneath the floor in one of the side rooms. Judah, or Judah Maccabee, was kind of the chief, the sergeant, Sergeant Judah Maccabee. Judah instructed his men to begin to cleanse the temple. He collected the vial of oil and used it to light the menorah, believing there was enough oil to keep the menorah lit for only one day. Miraculously, it continued to burn for eight days which was enough time to produce and consecrate new oil to sustain the light. And that took some time because in winter, uh, winter is not the time for pressing olives. So hidden stores of oil that might qualify had to be searched out and consecrated by the priests for use. And that's why it took so long for that to be done. On the eighth day, as Judah, that is Judah, returned to his residence, he walked through the section of the temple complex known as Solomon's Colonnade. <clears throat> Some of the Judeans asked him, what shall we do with the defiled altar stones? They can't be used again because we're unable to purge them of the pig's blood. Judah answered, when Messiah comes, he will tell us what to do with the desecrated stones. Some 200 years later, approximately 30 CE, it was winter, the time of the festival of Hanukkah, which was being celebrated in Jerusalem in memory of the Maccabean revolt and the rededication of the temple. Yeshua was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. Some of the Judeans who were there gathered around him and asked, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us publicly. Well, one of the reasons they were asking is they still had this old tradition from Hanukkah that the Messiah would tell them what to do with the desecrated stones. 
Hanukkah was yet another festival where Jews were focused on the idea of Messiah. And here's this upstart, this Rebbe from Galilee, the first century, century Israeli equivalent of a pastor from Ranui. And I love the next slide. Just soak that in for a bit. Just try and imagine that the background isn't present Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. Try and imagine that it's first century Jerusalem. Yeshua answered them, I have already told you, and you don't trust me. Now I'm picking Yeshua as the guy in the middle. Read it and weep, blonde Jesus. By prophesying his own sacrificial death and resurrection, Yeshua answered the question of what should be done with the defiled altar stones. You see, Yeshua was about to make the sacrifice to put an end to all sacrifice. If the sacrifice has been made and the altar has been established in a cross outside the city, what further need do we have of altars, stones? The answer to what should we do with the stones is throw them away. You don't need them anymore. Baruch Hashem. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This is first spoken to Yodim, to Israel, but it is also offered to all who will receive Yeshua and become grafted into the root of Ava, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Not to become Jews, but to feed from the same God who feeds the righteous among the Yehudim. In Messiah Yeshua, each of us have become a temple of the Spirit of God, each of us individually. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says this, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. In Messiah Yeshua, we, the community of faith, have become the temple of God's Spirit. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Think about how relevant that is right now. We have a decision to make. Will we honor and unite God's temple? Or will we fuss about like children throwing their toys out of a cot? Will we be desecrators of God's temple or will we be rededicators of it? In Messiah Yeshua, we, the community of faith, are symbolized by the menorah. Did you know that? It's wonderful. The idea is wonderful. 
given that the menorah is a symbol of the manifest glory and light of God, we are symbolized by it. How do I know? Well, I don't know. But Revelation 1.19 does. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden menorot, that's plural for menorah, the seven stars are the messengers, the angels of the seven faith communities. What are faith communities? Bodies of believers. Church. The seven stars are the messengers of the seven faith communities. And the seven men or gods are the seven faith communities. We're being told that when we gather together like this, the present light of the King Messiah is in our midst. This next slide brings us to that point where we need to understand our sanctification. Where we need to be sure that we don't allow the light that is in our individual temples and the light that is in the midst of our corporate temples is not allowed to go out. Yeshua says, if then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Thank God the light in us is not darkness because he is the light in us. But we are challenged with the story of Hanukkah. We're challenged with the metaphor of the story of Hanukkah. Don't allow pigs to be sacrificed on the altar of your inner being. Don't allow pigs to be sacrificed on the altar in your midst. Don't allow other gods to be placed in the holy of holies of your inner being. Don't allow other gods to be placed in the holy of holies of the midst of the church. But instead, like the Maccabees, oi, oi, oi. so now we've got Maccabees are uh, Christian heroes? but instead be those who intentionally work to rededicate the temple. To restore godly worship. To restore that in our own being and in the midst of the community of faith. And I think that's exciting. I was talking with a brother about all that's gone on. And I was excited to be able to think about ideas that, I guess, no matter how hard we've tries, tried as a body of believers through the centuries, the recent centuries, we've not been able to get this stuff happening. <clears throat> and and I'll, get to, I'll get to what I'm saying. While we've been doing this lockdown stuff and a lot of communities have been streaming their messages, believers have had to look for other ways to gather. Some of them have to do it more secretly than others. Some simply do it in families. They're linked together perhaps by a singular online message like what we've been doing. But the real work of being body is done in smaller groups by necessity. Now that's a problem for mega churches, isn't it? That's a problem when you've got millions of dollars tied up in buildings. But it's not a problem when you have it. And who needs buildings anyway? We might lose this building next year because of the way things are going. So, will we stop being a body of faith? No. 
We might meet in a backyard. We might, we, might, we might meet in a bigger home somewhere. We might meet in smaller groups all over the place and have like this central teaching platform. And hey, I've got an idea. That might mean that in the communities where we are, we might start connecting with other people in our communities who don't know the Lord. And they might start being part of our small group. And we won't be asking them for money for a building because we don't need their money. But they do need the gospel. And what about when the power gets switched off? There are a lot of pastors in this room and I'm not one of them. There are a lot of people gifted with other gifts of the Holy Spirit in this room that can be utilised in smaller groups. So we, we've been afforded an opportunity in our time to reassess and look at, and I'm not saying the early um, outbreak of Messianic belief from the book of Acts is the model for believing community. All I'm saying is, if we stopped thinking about all the passing things like tithing, buildings, money for pastors, if we stopped thinking about temporary things, maybe the church would grow. Because I can tell you that statistically in the West, the church has been shrinking exponentially for the last 40 years. And so, and okay, I'm not popular with anyone. So maybe the freedom we should be talking about is the freedom of Yeshua. Okay? And not the false freedom of so-called civil liberty. The freedom of Yeshua. And that doesn't mean there shouldn't be civil liberty. But what it means is we should stop focusing on the things that are passing away. Because I'll tell you this, the kingdom of God is not a democracy. And majority does not determine morality. So we need to allow God to reframe our thinking to think in a kingdom way instead of allowing our eyes to wander into the things of this world and constantly be concerned about them let's instead be concerned about making sure we understand Yeshua is essential and walking in that according to the spirit and I think I can't see anyone here who's not doing that already so again I always feel like I'm just talking to myself, but um, maybe someone out there needed that message, I don't know. Today afresh, and again I say it to myself, today afresh, let's take the opportunity afforded us by the celebration of Hanukkah to rededicate our lives to God, to individually and corporately do so. Let's ask Yeshua to purge us of any darkness in us and instead to illuminate our inner being with the light of his spirit into every dark corner of our being Hebrews 10 14 we only recently just did this and it was awesome and it's still awesome for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified disciples of Yeshua you are those who are being sanctified you know what he's done for you he's perfected you forever do you feel secure for by one offering he has perfected forever 
those who are being sanctified. You are those who are being sanctified. Baruch Hashem. Next week, and the people online need to hear this, so I'm going to do that spiel, and then we're going to light the Hanukkiahs. I know it's been a long night, but look, guys, I mean, you've got, what, three months to make up for? So we're actually going to be here till 3 a.m. this morning. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so next week, we are going to do this bald women and kippot, Okay. And um, I'm sure that in honour of this message, Julia will shave her head. <laughs> no, not going to happen? Okay. So it might just be the kapot. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we don't do things that way here, Julia. Um, <laughs> uh, So I'm going to teach on 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, and just try and give you some language and context to help you understand it better. Um, but now we are going to light the Hanukkiot together. And I want to stay live for this because here's the thing. In our family, in our family, we've developed this tradition, and I love it because it's a tradition that honors Yeshua. We understand that the servant candle on the Hanukkah, the Shamash, reminds us of the servant King Messiah, who said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so I see the Shamash, and I think Yeshua. And then I look that the Shamash is lit first, and then it's taken... And it lights each of the other candles. And it does so from the furthest point away from Jerusalem toward Jerusalem. From west to east, if you're where we are, in the diaspora. And so in our family, we all know people who have yet to meet Yeshua, the light of the world. And we also all know that no one can argue someone into salvation. What we are aware of is that the scriptures teach that the war HaKodesh reveals the Mashiach to a person. We will be faithful in giving an account, but it is Him. And so Yeshua comes to the unbeliever. We love Him because He has first loved us. And so we take the Shamash and we lift up to the Lord those who we know who are pre-Messianic. And we light a candle as a symbol, a kinetic prayer, that we are asking for their redemption and discipleship. And I'd like to invite you to participate in that tonight. I'd like you to think of someone or someones who you would petition God tonight that they would meet, and I mean meet, the person of Yeshua in a powerful, manifest, life-changing, kinetic, and transcendent way. And so I'm going to offer you the opportunity to do that tonight. There's lots of Hanukkiah there. Um, we will we'll get Kenzie to light the shamash on the first Hanukkiah there, and that shamash is removable. You can lift it out and take it to the other the other candles. Now the other Hanukkiot don't have a removable shamash, so don't go around trying to pull them, okay, it's going to get messy, wax everywhere, you know, I mean, some of us might need a wax, but please save that till the restrictions lessen, and you can go and get it at a caregiver or wherever you get it from. Okay, I don't know, who does waxes? I don't know. Was that wrong? Okay, never mind. Uh, okay, hairdresser? I don't know. Who, who does waxes? Therapist. A beauty, a beauty therapist or a beautician. Okay, I don't know, okay. It's been a long time since I got a bikini wax. Okay, so. So we're going to take this opportunity to do that. And um, first of all, we're going to get Bethany to say the Baha for lighting candles. Uh, just near Shell Hanukkah. 
And if you can just speak it into the microphone. And then if we, is there any way to just turn the main lights here off? And have like upstairs lights on or something? I'll do that one. Probably safer because... Say the blessing, Kenzie lights, and then we all take a turn lighting a candle. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidashanu, al yedet tov. Asher kidashanu, b'mitzvah tov, v'tzivanu. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidashanu, b'mitzvah tov, v'tzivanu, lehadli. So if you come and you take the Shema, this is the Shema, and then don't shoot the camera twice, and, and then light from this side of the Kamakia this way, and any of these Kamakios can be used. Okay, so those of you who uh, are still watching online, hey, good for you. I, um, Julia says I should be a bit radical and try and turn the camera and, and show you guys what's going on, so that's what I'm going to do.
Wow, that's bright. Maybe not that one. Okay, well, well thanks for joining us. We, we want to wish all you guys a Hanukkah Sameach who are watching online. Shabbat Shalom, Vilayla Tov, and into the new year, into the new week, Shavuot Tov. So, Chag Sameach, Hanukkah Sameach, Shabbat Shalom. We look forward to having you join us next week when we do our bald women and kippot. Yeah, yeah, well, so, so great to see you.